Looking back when our Manx kitten Lilo first got diagnosed with Manx syndrome, the interaction between the vet and myself was severely lacking and seemed very procedural in the sense that she x-rayed Lilo, came in, said that she had the congenital deformity, and then proceeded to throw out these debilitating and disheartening terms like quality of life and failure to thrive, ultimately recommending and sort of pushing towards the treatment of euthanasia. And while this video isn't meant to slam the vet or the clinic itself, the interaction did leave me feeling neglected as a pet parent because so much vital and crucial information was left out of that initial conversation that should have been had. After refusing the vet's recommendation to euthanize Lilo when she first got diagnosed, it caused me to do a lot of research about Manx syndrome on my own. Research that I wish would have been provided to me by the vet at the time of her diagnosis. And this is why I've come up with a list of my top six things I wish the vet would have discussed with me during her diagnosis. Number one, I wish the vet would have talked to me about Manx syndrome itself and what Lilo's specific diagnosis was or is. Lilo was diagnosed through an x-ray and on her x-ray you can see that she's a rumpy, meaning she has absolutely no tail. And in fact, the gene to shorten the tail actually shortened her spine. She's missing a few of her vertebrae, and ultimately these missing vertebrae impacted her neurological transmission. So her neurons aren't firing correctly to her synapses, which while it hasn't affected her mobility, it has affected her continence. Lilo is completely incontinent. She has no control over her bladder, her colon, or her sphincters. And this is something that should have been discussed by the vet. It should be known that while Lilo's Manx syndrome caused her to be completely incontinent with mobility of her legs, this isn't the case for every single cat with Manx syndrome. Some might not have mobility in their legs and some might be continent. The second thing I wish the vet would have discussed with me is how Manx syndrome can be sort of like a ripple effect in the sense that it can cause other conditions. For Lilo, one of those conditions is megacolon. She wasn't able to expel her bowels and it caused her colon to grow to a size disproportionate to what it should be. And because it's irreversible, her colon is now much larger than it should be, and it can be a serious condition. Another condition that the vet didn't really talk about, which looking back in hindsight is like, well, yeah, duh, like this could definitely be something that could be an issue, is her increased risk of a UTI or a urinary tract infection. And her UTI caused an increase in her renal or kidney values to a point where they thought that she was in renal failure. Now, for Lilo in particular, she is not in renal failure. She is fine now, but she was hospitalized for this and it caused her values to increase. It caused her kidneys to look abnormal during an ultrasound. But it's also another thing that I wish the vet would have been like, hey, she is at an increased risk for this. Like, be sure to monitor her. And one thing I've done research on is something called pretty litter. And for Lilo, we would be expelling her bladder into it, but if a cat is continent, they could just use it like a regular litter. And they go to the bathroom in it, and the litter itself will change colors and let you know, hey, this might be wrong with your cat. And kidney failure 
not necessarily is on there, but a UTI is, which is a great preventative measure for her potential to recontract that bacterial infection. Number three, and arguably the most important thing that the vet just either didn't know or was neglectful to mention, but having the diagnosis of Mink syndrome in absolutely no way is a terminal diagnosis. A large majority of Mink syndrome, if their pet parents are willing to put in that effort, can live a very normal life. Yes, you will have to put in more effort. You might have to do things you wouldn't have to do with a non-special needs cat, but that doesn't mean they're any less deserving of living a normal life or having a life at all. This leads me to number four, the medication. Medication can help mitigate some of the symptoms. In Lilo's case, she is now completely off medication and she doesn't need them, which is great because we've found alternative methods, which I'll talk about in a minute. But medication can really help Manx syndrome cats. Two of the most common medications used are cisapride and lactulose. And if you don't know these medications, cisapride helps the neurons fire in hopes of those neurons re-meeting the synapses to help maybe re-get some of their continence or some of their mobility. Whereas lactulose is more like a laxative. But even with these medications, you can start out and see if they help and maybe wean them back to see if you notice any change. For us, we made several changes at once. So when we made all of those changes, we noticed her improvement and then we slowly cut back on certain things to see if that affected her. And if we didn't see a decrease in change, then we just kept reducing whatever back, whether it was cisapride or lactulose or another method. And she is now actually completely off medications. And one of the things that does help her is a dietary change. Um, for cats, they get a large portion, I think it's like 80 or 90% of their fluid intake from their food. So it's very important to switch them over to a wet food diet. Additionally, if they do have diarrhea or constipation issues, we have found for Lilo specifically, and I understand that this doesn't work for all cats, but a little bit of pumpkin, the 100% puree pumpkin that you can find in the baking section of like any store, really helps her to control the consistency of her bowels. Number five. So a huge staple that we've implemented into Lilo's routine is butt baths and diapers. She gets a butt bath every single day, if not more than one, and it really helps to reduce the risk of urine scalding. Um, it's important that when you do give them a butt bath that you make sure you dry them afterwards we apply one of two things, which is either a A and D ointment, which you can find in the baby section, but we make sure that the one that we grab is zinc oxide free, which is important because it can be harmful to felines, or we use a spray, a Cavlon 3M spray, and we just spray it on her booty and we're good. And that creates a barrier between her skin and the leakage that she has. And number six, last but not least, of her bladder and her colon. This is huge because without expression, she would constantly be leaking because she has no control of her sphincters, which is basically what holds everything in for a normal functioning person or cat or whatever. Like those sphincters are what hold and release our bowel movements. For her, because she's completely incontinent and doesn't have any muscle tone or a 
ability to control her sphincters, she would leak all the time. And with the ability to completely eliminate her urine and free her colon, it lets her have more freedom. And if she has her nakey time after expression or we aren't able to closely monitor her and we put a diaper on her, then she doesn't even realize that she's special. Um, she plays like any other cat. She drinks like any other cat. She eats like any other cat. She has catitude like any other cat. And she's just loving life. Okay guys, and that was the six things I really wish the vet had talked to me about, whether it was about the condition itself, products, or routines. I hope you found this video helpful. If there's anything you think I forgot, a product you really enjoy, leave it in the comments below. I will read them, and if I haven't already tried it, I will totally try it with Lilo. Um, yeah, just let me know. Hit the like button, and see you next time.